NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. I'm going to start us off with some technology this morning that Jonathan's going to take over. But as we begin, the first thing we're going to think about here is there's different types of data that is coming from vehicles. You have it coming from event data recorders. Then the crash data retrieval is the method by which you gather that. The data repositories where the information actually gets to your vehicle. How does it go from these extraneous devices to your car? And then the actual in-vehicle infotainment and telematics data that can be recovered. But first, <clears throat> When do you start seeing forensic evidence like this? When does it happen? This technology will follow the same as cell phone and computer forensics. You did not see computer forensics cases in broad scope until FTK or NCASE created a tool that allowed the largest number of law enforcement to start utilizing that with the least amount of skill necessary, right? You have to have some automation to actually get through this process quickly and efficiently so they can even do the work and not require the level of expertise to do it, say, like at the bit level, so to speak. So it'll follow that. Same with cell phones. You did not see cell phone forensics in broad scope until Cellbrite released product that made it accessible uh, to non-highly technical people, right? That's when you start seeing that evidence. Burla is going to be the same exact technology. That is the company that creates the tools to do this. Uh, and that's exactly where we're headed. So you're going to see more and more of this coming from vehicles. And here is from the creator of Burla himself. Vehicles hold a vast amount of data that can be used to uncover critical information during an investigation. Their systems are constantly collecting and storing information about when a vehicle is used, how it is performing, and the environment around it. The information contained in these systems is extremely valuable. It will help you answer critical questions during your investigation, like what happened, where it occurred, and who was involved. Over the course of these videos, we are going to talk about the mountain of data that modern day vehicles generate and how to use it in an investigation. We will discuss the collection of tools that are available to help you identify vehicle systems, acquire the data, and analyze it. We will show you how to use the tools you currently have access to and how to determine which vehicle systems hold what data. So just think about that, right? As he is stating, the ability to have this technology in the hands of technical and non-technical people. The first point of contact, collecting that original evidence, that is always the most critical point uh, in protecting that, especially with digital evidence, because it's both fragile in the sense that it is uh, easily changed and volatile, uh, that it can be deleted, right? So when we're thinking about this technology and that IVE data, it's separate from these other forms of EDR and the crash data retrieval. Let's talk about that quickly and we'll get right back to IVE. So, what is an event data recorder? Often thought of as like the black box in the vehicle, this is recording very specific information about an accident itself. These have been in most cars since about 2014 and you do not have to have a high-end luxury car uh, to have one of these, right? Most vehicles have them and they have had them for a long time. Now what these devices do and their goal is to capture information about an actual accident, all right? So this is talking to all the various systems in the vehicle, these different systems that produce different electronic information. It's reading it, interpreting it, stuff from like airbags and so forth to give you that information. So it's recording that specific data related to an accident, okay? Now, what does that data look like? It looks like stuff like this. We're gonna just look at a couple slides. Engineering type data, we see changes in forward crash speed, maximum change in forward crash speed, and so forth. So this is the type of data that is generated through your input as you operate the vehicle. Now, CDR, or crash data retrieval, not to be confused with call detail records, right? Another acronym we get to learn. Uh, that's the actual process by which, using the tools and methods to collect the information from the event data recorder. Now, the data that is on these devices is very specific, as we've mentioned, and it also does not always uh, record and it doesn't always record for a long period of time. So first, this data is volatile uh, in the sense that if the airbags do not deploy in an accident, it's about four weeks that it will be retained on the EDR or about 250 ignition cycles, start stops of the vehicle, right? 250 of those. Uh, the other part of that is if the airbags are deployed, it's stored indefinitely. So you will have that data there. But this is seconds pre or post accident. This isn't user generated data related to actually what you're doing with the vehicle other than your input through 
uh, the actual vehicle through the steering wheel and pedals and so forth. Now, one quick thing to note, uh, with an EDR, if the impact is too low, say you hit a pedestrian, you hit a bicycle, it may not record an event data recorder, but it can record data related to that inside of an in-vehicle infotainment telematic system, because that system is recording data for long stretches of time, not as granular as you would around that EDR accident data, the five seconds before, five seconds after, a whole lot of data from an EDR. Less from an IVE system on that, but it records a lot of data you use for lifestyle analysis to see their actual patterns of the either driving activity or where they go and so forth, as we will see. So IVE is about seeing user interactions, what you have ingested and created by the user, using your brain more or less like that instead of the vehicle responses to your input like you get in the event data recorder. Now, IVE has progressed significantly over time. We see from like September 2017, about 10,000 vehicles that are supported. And if we skip up to today, we have 20, over 20,000. And the capabilities and the data you're collecting from these vehicles continues to expand. So not only is it greater support for more and more vehicles, it's also more data that is recovered. Because what's coming, and what the reality is, is hyperconnectivity. That's the goal. That is the goal of all of this technology for everything to talk to everything, right? You've heard of the Internet of Things and all this stuff. This is only to become more and more prevalent with all of our devices. So how does that evidence get on the infotainment system? Well, I like to think of it like this. Your car kind of treats it like a funnel. Um, you have these data repositories where data lives, whether that is a phone, backups, online accounts, places like that, your computer. So you could have something from your smartwatch that transmits that data from your watch to your phone, but then your phone connects to the car and transmits that data to the car, right? So any avenue or path that you can think of technologically that would allow it to get from point A to point X, it can do that, right? Through the various devices as it transmits that data, because this is collecting data on this watch, it's just a fancy sensor. It's got to be able to take that Apple Watch data and dump it to something that has processing power and storage capacity, which is your phone. And your phone connects to the car, which sucks that data down, right? That's how this works. So you have all types of data coming from a phone and all other things that are going to that device. So computer data, cell phone data, IoT devices, the primary sources of information going to a car that are user-generated data, all right? So what kind of data can end up on those infotainment systems, both now and in the future? And the future is really what interests me because yes, messages, calls, and so forth, biometric and location data even more so as we move forward with these devices. Now, all types of phone data. This is what's getting on your vehicles, right? So we're gonna look at data from an actual cell phone report, but think about this type of information as it travels to the car, right? We have an extraction summary here from Cellbrite, as you see, thousands and thousands of forensic artifacts. Everywhere you see something red, that's a deleted, recovered forensic artifact. That could be a message, a communication, or so forth, right? You have location activity. This is all the wireless networks your phone has seen, which could be transmitted later to another device, right? The granular, uh, the, the broadcast range for a wireless router in your house is about 150 feet. So if you have something like that, and your phone sees a wireless network, you can reward the fact that it just saw it. You don't have to connect to it for it to save it in your phone. It can look like this, right? Now, this is an actual case where you have hundreds of location points, 150 foot radius. Some of those have two locations because they have a five gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz band Wi-Fi in the house, right? All that granular location data down to the second. It's also harvesting location data from your phone from multiple sources, the cellular network. Uh, through the GPS, right? Every modern smartphone has five chips, one's a GPS chip. That's why your phone's better at navigating than your old TomToms, right? Location data coming from there. You have location data coming from application-based stuff too, whether that's Waze with your Apple Maps, uh, your calendar, it can pull that too. Uh, so the location data, including deleted location data, is becoming more and more extensive and recoverable. So you take that, what about user accounts? Finding more leads, more stuff to subpoena, more things to go after. That ends up on vehicles too. And your search activity can end up on vehicles potentially, especially in the future and so forth as well. You have internet history, which can and does end up on vehicles. And we have call logs, right? All this type of information that is extremely valuable and used, can be utilized in cases. Messaging, and one thing to note on the messaging in particular is your car is storing both SMS and MMS, short message service or multimedia message service messages that transmit via the sailor system in such a way where they can, yes, can create a record and a call detail report, but is also saving and potentially recording uh, application-based messaging, which transmits via data. If it transmits via data, it creates zero records in any call detail report or anything like that. So that includes 
WhatsApp, Instagram, Kick Messenger, Snapchat, you name it. Anything that is not an SMS or MMS will not create a record to call detail report, right? So like you see on this one, for example, you got like 13,000 messages, I believe, at the top that are standard SMS. In the bottom, you've got a whole lot more uh, of the application-based messaging, the data transmitted messages, 13,000 SMS, and then 28,000 iMessage communication with this phone, for example, and a lot of data leader recovered data. We also know that multimedia can be recovered and transmitted to the car. But what about the interplay between the phone and the car now? Uh, this is pretty interesting stuff here and data we're able to pull. We can actually see fingers on the phone. So what you're seeing right here is we can see when you plug the phone in, if you've plugged it in via USB to the car, or if you've plugged it in uh, uh, through a Bluetooth, you've connected via Bluetooth, right? If we move forward here, if we read down this list, as you can see, uh, these different artifacts, and I'll walk over here and point, what you're doing for the moment. Transition reason home screen, you clicked on the home screen, right? Right here, the, the screen went out because you haven't touched it. Lift to wake, pick your phone up right now. The screen turns on. We can see when you lift your phone to wake it. System gesture, that's swiping your finger on the phone, touching the device, guys. So if we look here, we can see when you unlock your phone, when you change your orientation from vertical to horizontal, uh, we can change, we can see that data. We can also see it in timeline view like this with all of that activity, including like right here, when you took the picture with geolocation data, all that information as well. And if we look at it further in a timeline view, you see device events, you have your applications that are used, you have your instant messaging, you've got device events, instant messaging, down to the second activity of what a person is doing on that phone. Uh, one of the most best ways to create user attribution, answer those who, what, when, where, and why questions. Now, if we also think about the other types of data, we have Internet of Things information as well. This data is coming from wearable technology devices. Remember, we have silos where data gets and ends up and is stored. These are your cell phones contained in the applications, computers on the computer itself or in an online account, right? That's typically where data ends up that we go and collect it. The data from stuff like this, who has a fitness wearable like a smartwatch or something now in here, right? Oh, y'all are low adopters. This is usually a lot of hands go up. Uh, that's good. Maybe it's part of the line of work you do. But as you see here, uh, this unlimited timeline of activity for a year and a half for me from this watch, you've got my workouts, you've got my sleep, you've got my nutrition through another app that's connected to this one, heart rate variability, heart rate, sleep scheduling, and so forth. You have all of that information in here. So how can you use this? What's the usefulness of this, video, this type of data? You can think of a lot of stuff. One, if somebody says I'm assaulted and you look at the heart rate data and it's equivalent of being like, you know, sitting on the couch watching Netflix and eating Cheetos, Maybe they weren't assaulted, right? Pull that heart rate data, give it to the right expert. What about this one? This is from a truck accident case we worked on. And in this one, it was a medical event that caused the accident, right? Was it distracted driving? No. The watch reported uh, that it was a medical event. The person had a stroke, right? Interesting data you can pull there. This one is a case I consulted on. This was a civil case. We were retained by the defense. But just to illustrate this type of information, too, that could end, end up on a vehicle through the phone from a device at some point. And this one, this is a cyclist going downhill and hit a truck head on, clear open intersection. Theory of the defense was, is that he wasn't looking and hit it. That was affirmed by looking at especially that Vector 3.3S device at the end. That goes on the crankshaft of a bike and records the wattage output of how hard you're pedaling. Never drops. He's pedaling as hard as he can all the way straight into that truck, right? Theory of the case, what makes the most sense? He's training. He's going real fast. He looks, sees a clear intersection, gets aerodynamic over the front of that bike, straight into it, never looks up, right? That would be consistent with the facts of never slowing down from that Vector 3.3S. That's the type of data. Now, when you get to all that, then you get to the IVE data. So what are we actually seeing on vehicles now? What's being recovered and how does this look? This is how this looks. We're gonna actually see some clips too, but here's a rental car. You can see all these phones plugged into this rental car. As you go scroll down this list, we have all these different phones by all these different custodians. We have Tiffany's phone, Will J's Herondale's phone, as you can see, Jennifer's phone, Aaron's phone. So when you plug your phone in, it is pulling data from your device. So what does that look like? And what is it when it's collecting that data from these connected devices? Connected devices are devices that have been connected to a vehicle via Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or USB. While tablets, laptops, flash drives, and media cards are part of this category, by and large, most investigators are focused on finding data related to mobile phones. Regardless of the device type, when a device is connected to a vehicle for the first time, metadata about that device is captured by one or more of the vehicle systems. 
The metadata includes unique identifiers such as serial numbers, MAC addresses, subscriber numbers, MZs, IMEIs, and ICC IDs. Once a device is fully connected, data will be transferred from the device to one of the vehicle systems. Which system it goes to depends on several factors related to the overall vehicle, but it is generally the infotainment or the telematics system. The data that is transferred from the device depends on the class of device. For example, when a mass storage device like a flash drive or media... We're hung up. Continuing on that, so when you hook that device into the vehicle, it's transferring that type of user data that you create, that human-generated data that can both include different types of messaging, it can include uh, other information related to uh, your emails, your, your connected devices, the calls that you've taken, the... Are we back yet? Not yet. Your contact list, it can also see even things like, here we go, let's get right back on the pace. Things like call logs, all right? We're gonna skip the videos and stick with this to keep this safe over here. Call logs, and they're not only do you recover the call logs, you recover the information that is tied to specific accounts, recorded back to specific devices even from the call logs we here see here. You have contact information, and not just are you getting those contact details back, you're getting all the details related to that contact as they were copied to the car. It's not just the phone number and the name, it's that full contact detail. So if you've ever had somebody, you've got three or four phone numbers, you've got multiple emails, you've got a lot of data in there about them, you may have personal notes about some people to remember who they are. That can all be saved as a part of this as well inside of that data when you connect it. And then you have even files associated with what's on that drive. So these can be files like you pull from a computer or music. You can see what they're listening to. Uh, for example, when I've worked on some like mass shooting cases, for example, it's not a question of whether they did the act or not, right? The question is why? And a lot of times what you're doing is you're going through and pulling information for somebody who can analyze that appropriately. We're just the, the intermediary to get it to a point where it can be digestible to somebody else. What are you listening to? Were they radicalized by something? This is the type of information you can get in your car, right? When you ride in your car, do you listen to stuff? You listen to stuff, right? What you listen to influences you. Information provided right there as well. You also have track logs and other information that are recorded. And remember, these track logs, as they are recorded, doesn't mean you even have to have a navigation set. Most modern vehicles are recording where you go, whether you have a location set or not. They're recording those locations and where you went and those tracks, those tracks make up different types of trips uh, that provide a whole lot of geolocation information, including to the point where they can animate these different tracks so you can see them as you move through time. Uh, you can see all of that activity. You can see the other waypoints they have put in and that, that location activity as well. And you have other forensic artifacts, including data related to things like velocity points or how hard you are dry, how hard you accelerate, how hard you stop, uh, other information like that as well. So as you see, there's a tremendous amount of information that is being collected from these vehicles that is, being, uh, that is gonna be coming to your vehicle, especially from your phones, your computers, your wearable devices, and it's only gonna be more and more expansive as we continue to see this hyper-connectivity between all these forms of technology. All right. Thanks, Lars. Um, so, some of the areas that Lars uh, talked about in terms of some of the most constitutionally protected and private uh, categories of information, medical data, uh, biometric data, communicative contents, so emails, messages, call logs, um, location information, and also if we get into cell phones and different devices that are connected with our um, with our vehicles, you can see what happens within a person's home. So you can see um, what our courts have said are, would reveal the privacies of life, window into our soul. So um, I was just, as uh, Lars was talking about the wearable devices and um, different biometric and medical data, you know, I, as a criminal defense lawyer, I have, a Google, I have different Google alerts that are set up and, uh, some of you may have these. I have murder trial as a, as a search term that I get information on. I don't always read it, but there was one that was particularly interesting to me, which was, a, is there anybody here from Connecticut? No. 
There's a case in Connecticut that went to verdict last week, and it was a man that was charged with uh, the killing of his wife. He was having an affair, and he gave a story uh, to the police. He gave a statement to the police that this that was uh, contradicted by his wife's Fitbit. And that case is called the Fitbit murder case. So um, the man was convicted last week. I was actually just Googling it um, while Lars was uh, wrapping up. But that's the type of information and how important this information is to police investigations. So you have a client gives a statement that, you know, a masked man came into the house and his, his wife was out running. I probably don't have the facts right, but something like that. And her Fitbit completely uh, contradicts that, uh, that story. Um, I think the defense tried to cast, um, tried, to, tried to challenge the reliability of that data, but it was so important that this case that went on for weeks, this murder trial that went on for weeks, was named the Fitbit murder case and um, wrapped up last week with, with a guilty verdict. Um, so when we go through, um, in terms of practically speaking, we talk about the EDR and the infotainment system. When you're in your car, uh, steering wheel is here. The EDR, the black box, is right underneath the steering wheel. The, um, to access that information, the most common tool that's used is that green box right there, which is Bosch uh, CDR, Crash Data Retrieval Tool. Um, that will connect to a computer and then it connects underneath there uh, with the, the onboard diagnostic system, which is what your mechanic uses to run um, diagnostics on your car, check uh, codes and things like that in the car. The infotainment system, and Lars talked about what you can retrieve from an EDR, a black box on a vehicle. It's, it's much more limited than um, say in a, in a plane, when a plane crashes, it goes back about two hours in the data. You get audio from the cockpit, not the same from a vehicle. This generally goes back about five seconds and it's not always triggered by uh, events like pedestrian versus uh, automobile accidents. Um, so that's the data that is pulled off the EDR there. And you have different limited categories of data, braking data, acceleration, um, speed over time, and that's right underneath the steering wheel. The infotainment system is right in the middle, right? So it's the computer screen that, that almost every car that's uh, rolled off the lot nowadays has in them. They used to just be, um, they just used to just be in ve uh, vehicles that were kind of luxury vehicles, but now they're in every single uh, one of our vehicles. Um, the infotainment system and the IV tool that Berla designed, it is not widely available. I mean, it's available if you can purchase it, you have the money to purchase it from the police departments, but the cost and the training is what makes these tools, we don't see them in the same way that we see Celebrate. How many, how many lawyers in the room have seen Celebrate in their criminal cases? About 60%. Um, how many of you have had Berla in your cases? So maybe four hands, and one of them is, is my partner, Todd, who uh, we learned about Berla together because of a murder trial that we did a few years ago, um, which gives me a unique perspective into this technology. So that's the EDR. The IV tool that Berla developed is, um, costs several thousands of dollars. They conduct trainings. Lars and Invista are trained in it, um, but it's not widely available, and they are partnered with law enforcement. So I don't know that we would be able to get this technology. I have certainly tried to, I tried to download their app and get in their system, and they, they just blocked me and said that I was, wasn't eligible. Um, but they are, they are aligned with law enforcement and private industry. Um, they have a partnership with DHS, and it's a, it's a tool that is able to extract and analyze vast, vast amounts of data. So you, you have the EDR, the black box, you've got GPS in the car, and then you also have the different devices that connect to our cars. This is kind of the, 
the progression of smartphones over time, um, where you see them getting more and more detailed, containing more and more information and revealing more and more about us and our clients over time. That is IBM's Simon Personal Communicator, which I never knew about, but I guess, I guess it's, it's said to be the first smartphone, had some um, features of smartphones like uh, you could do some email and messaging, it had a touch screen, and then you have what we now know as, as our smartphones, the Apple iPhone, where you have your calendar, you have your messages, your Google search history, um, you have biometric and medical data if you're connecting Fitbit or any wearable devices to it, and just, just a vast amount of information. Lawyers might have our Dropboxes, our, our Box.com, um, information on there with, with privileged client information. So a great amount of uh, information that reveals a lot about us and our clients. Um, many computers in our pockets. And in terms of the Fourth Amendment and uh, w what we're talking about here today, I think, you know, and I think Mike Price will talk about it later, but the, the line of cases starting with uh, Kylo in 2001 going through Jones and uh, Riley and Carpenter stand for the proposition that when we talk about digital information, it is fundamentally, constitutionally different than what we talk about with physical objects, right? That was the issue in Riley, whether they could search a cell phone without a warrant incident to arrest. So in Robinson, they said, yeah, that's fine. If you get arrested, you can go through uh, somebody's billfold incident to their arrest. But when we talk about um, cell phones and the vast amount of data that they contain, the private data that they contain, it is of a different constitutional dimension. So when we talk about cell phones, and I think they, they coincide, we, we think about digital privacy and how we protect our devices. Um, it, it's interesting when you talk about that in the context of vehicles, because there's a great amount of ways that we can protect our data from private companies, from government. But when it comes to, to cars, which are recipients of the very same data, there is no way. There's no way that I know of, and I've asked Lars and people that know these systems, there's no way to encrypt our data. So police get a search warrant for our, you know, our client's cell phone. They can't get into the cell phone because it's a 19 digit alphanumeric passcode and they're not they're not going to get into it state doesn't file a motion to compel or the government doesn't file a motion to compel uh, your client to give up his passcode or his biometric data they can still get that uh, information from your vehicle's car and we'll come to it a little bit later but there's a professor um, in virginia at william and mary that has written an article that stands for the proposition that he thinks that the courts will uphold warrantless, warrantless searches of these, recipro these reciprocals of vast amounts of client data without the mechanism to protect that data in any way. So we talk about passcodes and biometrics. Um, I did this kind of, it, we did this talk uh, last month in Vegas for, for forensics and I took a, a show of hands from the lawyers in the room, and I was, I was a bit surprised by it, but how many of the lawyers in the room have a four-digit passcode on their cell phone? Couple. How many have a six-digit passcode? Okay, it's most of the room, and it's, it's most of the room because it's the default, right? We, we think that's, that's what's available because that's the default. So um, only because I got kind of nerdy on this stuff, and I had a case with, uh, Todd and I had a case with Mike Price, years ago, and I was talking to Mike about, you know, digital privacy and how to protect our data and how to advise our clients about how to protect our data. And I didn't know, I had a six digit passcode, and I didn't know that, you know, with, with a warrant and with Celebrite and uh, Gray Key, that the police would be able to get into my phone within a day with a six digit passcode at the time. The, Technology is better now. They can get with now. They can get into the phone of your client with a six-digit passcode within a few hours. So if you expand that to let me let me ask how many lawyers in the room or, or people in the room have a passcode 
that is 12 digits or, or more, an alphanumeric. One, two, three, four. My partner Todd, Logan from Upturn, and a couple uh, very smart lawyers. Okay, that's good. Because um, after I, I had changed mine to a 12 digit passcode, and I just, it, I just doubled it. It was the six digit, and I doubled it. Um, after talking to Lars Daniel, I, I thought I was like pretty sharp, you know, and I saw him in Austin. I said, you know, you have, you have uh, Celebrite and, and Great Shift. How, how quickly would you get into my cell phone? I got a 12 digit passcode. And he said, is it alphanumeric? I said, no. And he said, how many digits? 12 digits. He said, well, between two hours and uh, 30 years. And, and I, I was like, well, but my price told me like, you know, two, three years ago that it would take over 100 years to get into my cell phone with a 12-digit passcode. So now I have a 17-digit alphanumeric passcode, and I pretty much just keep my phone open. Um, so I like butt dial people by accident. It's always, but, but I feel comfortable that if I'm stopped by law enforcement, that I can lock my phone and that they won't just be able to willy-nilly get into my phone, get into my text messages with my family, my text messages with my partner and partners and clients, and get into my Dropbox and all those different areas of very uh, sensitive, protected data. So biometrics, how many of the lawyers in the room have biometrics, either a, a thumbprint, a fingerprint, or facial recognition to get into their phones? I'd say probably about 30% of the room. Um, so when we talk about, this is more Fifth Amendment than Fourth Amendment, but I think they go hand in hand when we talk about privacy and um, our clients' constitutional rights. When it comes to the courts and analyzing the issues about compelling a client to give up their passcode or to uh, surrender their thumbprint or their face to a sensor on the phone. So, please get a warrant, right? Uh, they ask politely for us to have our client give our passcode. We politely, based on the advice of counsel, decline that request from law enforcement. They go to the judge and seek a compulsion order, or they file a motion to compel. There's a terrible case that just came out of the fourth district in Illinois that I'm gonna to touch on, um, but if, if there are biometrics on the phone, they are generally less protected than if you just have a passcode. And it's, it's, you know, there's some courts that have said, it doesn't really make sense in the digital world to, to say that it's different to present a thumbprint or your face than to just type in your passcode that this kind of mental versus physical dichotomy doesn't make any sense. And some courts have said that. Some courts have said that here in federal court in Chicago. Other courts in federal court in Chicago have said, no, that's not, that's, that's not right. Fifth Amendment doesn't apply. Foregone conclusion doctrine applies. But generally speaking, um, and this is, this is the Fourth Amendment Center's compelled decryption primer, and there's this, I think, was last updated uh, a year or two ago, there's tons of more cases. There's a case in the Illinois Supreme Court right now that uh, the Fourth Amendment Center and the Illinois uh, Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, EFF and ACLU, are going to do a joint amicus on that deals with this very issue. But these, these issues are making their way through courts. Generally speaking, biometric lock on there, less protection. It's pretty much like standing in a police lineup. It's pretty much like surrendering a key that your client has in their possession. And it's not like uh, compelling your client to give up uh, the code to a uh, wall safe. So this kind of mental versus physical dichotomy. So generally the way that I advise clients, get rid of the facial recognition, get for a number of reasons, get rid of the biometrics get a passcode that's 12 or 13 digits or more, alphanumeric, and that is the way that we protect ourselves and our clients' data from the government. Here's a little bit of an overview of Illinois case law. There is the Sneed case that I referenced from the 4th District, a trial court in DeWitt County, downstate. Um, 
denied the state's motion to compel uh, a client's, uh, compelling the client to give up their passcode after a search warrant was issued. And, and the trial court there said they were doing that based on this other case from the third district, Spicer. The Sneed case from the fourth district in Springfield um, went through the history of the cases and went through the history of Spicer and said that it was um, that it was decided wrongly. And it said, it ultimately came to the conclusion that compelling an accused to provide the entry of his cell phone passcode, this was a passcode, and at oral argument, the, the lawyer from the office of the state appellate defender was asked basically about bi biometrics and if he agreed that that would provide less protection. And he said, yeah, you know, said, yeah but this is a passcode case, so it's a passcode, no biometrics. That compelling the client to provide the entry of his cell phone passcode would not violate his Fifth Amendment rights as that act was deemed non-testimonial. So it's got, for the Fifth Amendment to apply, it's got to be incriminating, uh, testimonial, uh, and compelled. The Sneed Court said the proper focus of the foregone conclusion exception to the Fifth Amendment is on the passcode itself, not the contents of the phone. So that's, uh, other courts have said different things. Spicer said uh, that the, the analysis was different. Spicer said that compelling a, an accused to provide a cell phone passcode would violate his Fifth Amendment rights and that the foregone conclusion exception did not apply as the state could not establish the contents of the phone with reasonable particularity. So got a bit of a district split. The Sneed case, a very bad case for us. And so there's gonna be a concerted uh, amici uh, effort behind the Office of the State Appellate Defender because it's a, it's a case in Illinois uh, for us that practice in state courts that is going to be of fundamental importance. Federal cases, and these are all biometrics cases. So uh, there was a, a very good early opinion by Magistrate Judge Weissman um, in, in regards application of a search warrant from 2017 and Magistrate Judge Weissman held that compelling a thumbprint to unlock a, an encrypted device violated the Fifth Amendment because the act constituted a testimonial act of production. There was also a good uh, opinion from Magistrate Judge Finnegan from 2017 that said denying the search warrant to compel four individuals to unlock unspecified at app, Apple devices during the search of uh, subject premises, fingerprint unlock was compelled act of production. Case was flipped by the Article III judge, and that is the 2007 case by District Court Judge uh, Chang, where Judge Chang said that requiring the application of fingerprints to the censor does not run afoul of the self-incrimination privilege of the Fifth Amendment because the act does not qualify as a testimonial communication. There's also a bad case from Magistrate Judge Harjani from a couple years ago, and, um, but you see the application of the Fifth Amendment to biometrics cases. So some judges says it, it doesn't matter that much, it's the same thing, it's locking the cell phone, but it's this mental versus physical dichotomy. Whether you're just presenting your thumb, presenting your face, or whether uh, presenting your passcode reveals the contents of the mind. So, how do we change our passcodes? Uh, people have asked me this, so I actually lay it out here. If you have an iPhone, go into your settings, right? Click on Face ID and Passcode. Enter your passcode. For most folks in the room, it's gonna be a four or six digit passcode, because those are the defaults. Click Change Passcode. Enter your old passcode or your current passcode. Do not, it'll prompt you to enter a new six digit passcode. Don't do that. Go to the bottom of the screen and click passcode options. Under there you'll see different options, but click uh, create a custom alphanumeric code and you can, you can make it up to uh, 34 digits, which I don't recommend. What, what I did is I have a pattern, you know, cause I would never remember it. But alphanumeric, important, and the length, super important. 
And there's only like a few clients that I've talked to or you say, you know, how long's your passcode? And you know, they mostly say four or six digits. There's only a few that have said like, oh, it's 13 digits and it's alphanumeric. And I'm like, you need to come lecture at the NACDL. <laughs> And this is what we're really talking about today, which is the infotainment systems, the computer systems that are in our vehicles. Right in the middle, computer screen, and inside the module. Here is Ben Lemaire in a more casual setting than uh, kind of the, the formal training videos that, that, um, that Lars pulled up. But here is Ben Lemaire talking to a couple like podcast guys about the vast amounts of data that our, that our vehicles, rental vehicles, can pull off our phones when we connect them by USB and even with Bluetooth um, unwittingly, unwittingly, without consent and without any type of authorization. That's pretty cool. Um, I think a lot of people right now who are listening to this are probably thinking, well, yeah, but I have to do something special for my car to download all that information, or I have to hook it up in a certain way. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, if you we use this scenario all the time uh, training. You know, if you're you're on a flight, you fly in, you rent a car, and uh, you know your phone died. You're going to get in the car and you're going to plug it in, and there's going to be this nice, convenient USB port right there for you. you know, <laughs> when you plug it into the USB port, it's going to charge your phone absolutely, and as soon as it powers up, it's going to start sucking all your data down into the car. Um, there's one manufacturer in particular that will ask you, do you want to download your contact list? And of course, you know, being a rental car, you would say no, uh, and it honors that one thing, but it takes everything else that it can get its hands on. <laughs> it's, it's funny. I mean, they actually, you know, said, well, you know, people care about their contact list, and little do they know that their entire text messaging database is being sucked down onto the car. Um, so, it's uh, so you don't know. Rent a car, plug in your USB, and it's wiping all your data down into the, into the car which nobody would agree to, right? Like download your contact list, no thank you. You know, download all of the information on your little computer that you have in your, your cell phone, no thank you if it was made available, right? 4% of people are gonna opt in to uh, the apps that track us, right? I mean, when Apple uh, updated their software last year, um, only 4% of people would actually app, opt into that tracking. But to go in and effectively try to lock, you know, the government out, try to lock third parties out, it's also about 4% because it's just like a four-digit or six-digit passcode. We just kind of don't know. There's defaults and we're routed through these different systems in a certain way. Um, I've got a fair amount more material to go through. So anyways, Perla, um, the company that we've talked about, was founded in 2008, works closely with the government first was analyzing handheld devices like Garmin's TomToms, launched the IV forensics tool in 2013. They do uh, multiple updates every year and more and more models of cars are accessible to be dumped and analyzed. Um, Burla reports, you'll see one, uh, they're hundreds of pages along like Celebrite. You've seen all the different areas of data that uh, the IV tool can pull off our vehicles. So this brings us to the, the murder trial of uh, our client, Corey Morgan, who was charged with two co-defendants and how the Burla uh, data became relevant in the case. Here's kind of a background of the case. In Chicago today, there was a tragic revelation in the murder of a nine-year-old boy. Dean Reynolds is on that story. All week, Chicago has been asking why nine-year-old Tyshawn Lee was murdered in this alley. And now, the police have supplied a horrifying answer. We believe that Tyshawn was targeted, lured to this spot, and murdered. Gary McCarthy is Chicago's police superintendent. Probably the most abhorrent, cowardly, unfathomable crime that I've witnessed in 35 years of policing. Tyshawn was on his way to his grandmother's on Monday afternoon when he joined others in the alley near her house. That's when the boy was swept up into a bloody feud here involving two rival factions of the same gang. His execution was the latest in a series of vengeful assaults going back months. Police say Tyshawn's father, Pierre Stokes, is an active member of one of those gang factions, and they believe that's the reason his son was targeted. 
Stokes himself agrees his son was intentionally killed. If he wasn't a target, he wouldn't have got hit so many times in the back of the face. You know what I'm saying? I think he was targeted. So, prosecution's theory from the very beginning, Pierre Stokes, um, Tyshawn Lee's father, was kind of a gang leader. There was a gang war going on on the south side of Chicago. And during that gang war, um, Corey Morgan's brother had been killed and his mother had been shot after his mother had picked up Corey's little brother from a parole meeting. And there was a bunch of violence that went back and forth, a bunch of murders. So the, the theory ver very early on was that this was a gang-related uh, killing and a horrible, senseless murder of a very innocent uh, young child. So um, there's a task force, about 100 uh, officers, detectives, federal agents that uh, were part of the investigation in this case. The Burla, so this vehicle, uh, the suspect vehicle early on from the eyewitnesses and the pod cameras um, was said to be this black SUV. So they identified this black SUV um, that was dumped out in the southwest suburbs in Dalton and they extract from the vehicle, the Illinois State Police do, the module here. That is the infotainment system module. And you see the police um, extracting it there. That's the, the computer screen and that's the inside module. So they pull out that module and they dump it. And the ISP sends it to uh, the East Coast, to Annapolis, to be dumped by Burla. See the different areas of data there that, uh, that the extraction or acquisition report uh, contains it's about 700 pages long, so similar to a Celebrite report and all the different categories of information that it has there. Uh, tracks, that's geolocation data, right? And when we see um, the relevance of that, both to the Fourth Amendment and the case, this was an abandoned vehicle, so there was no, we had no standing to contest any of the dumping or analysis of uh, the vehicle. It was associated with a co-defendant as well. But when you see how detailed the location data is, um, it's second by second. So we're talking about Carpenter and Jones in terms of movement over time. Uh, here, attached devices. See 16 devices that were attached to that vehicle over time. Different names associated with each one of them. Bluetooth addresses, unique identifiers. Our client's uh, cell phone, never never connected to that uh, to that. Uh, vehicle. And uh, in your materials and supplemental materials, there's the direct and cross-examination of Ken Case from Burla, and then there's a bunch of other materials that are relevant to what Lars and I are talking to, about here today. Uh, you have different events, gear shifts, USB connecting and disconnecting, door events, passenger doors opening and closing, driver's door open and closing, and uh, phone events. These are the track logs that were recovered. And you see here um, GPS coordinates and also second by second where this vehicle is. This is the examination report. The Cook County State's Attorney's Office and Chicago Police Department shared expenses on this case and pre-trial they were about $30,000. Um, they gave, the State's Attorney's Office gave certain addresses that were associated with uh, the case. Kevin Edwards' house on Green Street Old Farm Road in Lansing is where Corey Morgan lived with his girlfriend, Robin Matthews, and the crime scene uh, at the bottom there. So what do the witnesses say occurred in this case? Um, there's this motive, and basically in opening statement they said, they call themselves the BBGs, Pierre Stokes, Tyshawn's father. He was a member of the Kill Awards. And back on October 13th of 2015, this feud escalated, and it escalated when Morgan's uh, brother, Tracy Morgan, and Morgan's mother was shot. Morgan's mother survived, but Tracy Morgan was killed. Now, Tracy Morgan was a fellow BBG, and killing him was bad enough, but shooting Morgan's mother was beyond the pale. There weren't many rules in this feud, but family was off limits. They were untouchable, and so this made Morgan mad. He wasn't just mad, he was in a murderous rage saying he was going to kill grandmas, mamas, kids and all. Anyone he could catch. So there's a statement that's attributed to a third party admission 
by a member of Kevin Edwards' family, his sister. Prosecution continues. And this defendant, Corey Morgan, he was identified by four different witnesses as being there. And that black SUV, it was later found abandoned in Dalton. And it turns out that the black SUV is a Ford Edge, the same Ford Edge that Kevin Edwards had been driving for about a month before Tyshawn's murder. And that Ford Edge has GPS and navigation capabilities. Now, GPS and navigation, they can get you where you need to go, and they can tell you which direction to go. But they can also tell you they can also tell where you've been. And I'll give you one guess where that Ford Edge was on November 2nd, 2015. It was, cycling, it was circling Tyshawn's house and it was parked near the mouth of that alley, the alley that ultimately um, Tyshawn Lee was killed in and the witnesses said that they saw this SUV going around and into the alley. Um, in preparation for cross-examination of Ken Case, we interviewed him over the phone. We got his PowerPoint, uh, his PowerPoint presentation. State was like trying to give us like just the printouts of his slides in court, just show it to us. And we're like, no, we, we want to see the, you know, the, the PowerPoint itself. It had all of his notes and everything on there. Turns out when we interviewed him, he had, he had done a, another analysis the other day just to make sure the data was consistent. And um, so it, he did a bunch of different, different uh, parsings of the data. And so you have Kevin Edwards' uh, relatives, his sister says on a very specific date after Tracy Morgan's murder that at the Edwards family home at 106th and Green that uh, Corey Morgan had made that statement about that the GDs done tweaked when they killed Tea Time, that's his brother. Everybody must die, grandmas, mamas, kids and all. It was a very important statement of motive, third party admission that was attributed to Corey Morgan. Kevin Edwards' brother, um, terrible siblings. I mean, they, they both came in and testified against him, and um, he said that Kevin Edwards had that car for a month before. So we looked at the data, um, and we looked at the data from the, the, the Edwards house. There was no data that coincided with the vehicle being there on the 14th or every day th for a month. There was a few different uh, dates of there, three or four, one coincided with the brother calling in the police to give the car a traffic ticket. Um, and that was also true of the vehicle being at Corey Morgan's house every day. The data didn't support it. So we made use of that. The, the state's PowerPoint presentation, I'll take you through it uh, quickly, but the state took Ken Case from Burla through a PowerPoint that he put together that showed the different data from the vehicle. So you have the vehicle starting in Lansing, Corey Morgan's house with uh, Robin Matthews, his girlfriend, Old Farm Road, going to the gas station up the street. There's video from the gas station that corroborates that. No data, so no data during that period, probably because it was overwritten. Then you have the crime scene, Dawes Park, the alley being just uh, upward or north there on the screen. And you have the track logs there directions of travel over time. You have the X is the murder scene at the alley. Park is down screen. And you have the movements of the vehicle, different vehicle events that um, the state said were corroborated by, uh, were corroborating their eyewitness testimony. No data again, most likely overwritten. And then more track logs. So circling the neighborhood, over time, and ultimately going back to Dawes Park near the crime scene. And you have the vehicle, the black Ford Edge, coming back to Dawes Park, coming to rest, and vehicle events that are consistent with it stopping and letting out the occupants. Then you have some data that was overwritten to make room for more data, and then you have the vehicle coming back to the Lansing House and different vehicle events that are consistent with it stopping there, people getting out, going back to the gas station later that evening, no data, and then the vehicle data picking up in Dalton where uh, it was abandoned and that was the last data on the vehicle. So the trial of Corey Morgan, there's me and Todd and our senior partner Tom Bream and our client Corey Morgan. This was the headline in the Chicago Tribune after Ken Case testified. 
G GPS data ties getaway car to scene of nine-year-old Tyshawn Lee's killing. Prosecution expert testifies. So what happened with Corey Morgan? I love to stand up here and say, we made such, such great hay with the Burla expert and Todd Pugh gave such a, an amazing closing argument, which he did, that we won the case. Like Brendan and Debbie who won cases based on cultivating the different information in the case. We didn't. Corey Morgan was convicted. He was, that was after 10 hours of deliberation. The judge in the case locked the jury up at nine o'clock at night, put him at a hotel in the Southwest side of Chicago, not quite uh, the Swiss hotel. And uh, they came back, switched jury uh, four people. And ultimately Corey Morgan was a victim of the trial penalty. He was offered 25 years pre-trial. It was never an offer that he was going to accept. And he was never going to plead guilty to the murder of a nine-year-old child. His co-defendant, Kevin Edwards, did take that offer and is doing 25 real years, but um, will get out of prison at some point. Corey, after sentencing, got 65 years, de facto life sentence. So what the future holds, quickly, Fourth Amendment, touchstone reasonableness. Uh, protects our persons, houses, papers, effects. Effects are our cars, our papers, our on our phones. This is Professor Adam Gershowitz, who is the professor that says that warrantless searches of infotainment systems will be upheld. Um, we'll go quickly through it, but he says basically that they will be upheld based on the automobile exception, and that while the Supreme Court in Riley said that warrantless searches of smartphones, incident to arrest, uh, were banned, that the Supreme Court left the door open to other exceptions to the warrant requirement, automobile exception, exigent circumstances, plain view, et cetera, and that the automobile exception would allow law enforcement to obtain massive amounts of information from the vehicle's infotainment system, just like the police can rip through uh, seats and tires looking for kilos. It's different, right? It's, it's, not, it's, it's not a physical object when we talk about this data. So um, there's different reasons. I'd, I'd point you to his working paper um, but I think that he is wrong, and Mike Price thinks he's wrong, so I, I feel like I, I'm somewhat more confident that he's wrong, because Mike thinks so. Um, but it, going through the different precedents, Jones, movement over time. Carpenter, movement over time. We're talking about infotainment, it's location on a second-by-second -second basis. Riley talks about the, the window into the soul, right? I mean, if you get into our phones, you get into what's happening in our homes. You get into pretty much every aspect of our lives. And so these cases will absolutely apply and warrants will be required. In Chicago, they do it in both state and federal court. Uh, they get warrants for these things. There's a case from Georgia Supreme Court that said that law enforcement search of a black box, just a black box, limited data, is a search that requires a warrant and that the automobile exception and the exigent circumstances exceptions to the warrant requirement do not apply to the warrantless search of the black box. So an important precedent, state court precedent uh, that I think will apply. There's good amici in that. The ACLU's brief in Mobley is uh, part of the materials. And uh, there's a bill in Congress that Senator Wyden has, uh, has introduced, it's bipartisan, and it's called Closing the Warrantless Digital Car Search Loophole Act. And it's a good bill. We should be passing them uh, state by state and also at the federal level. So that's all I've got. Um, I think we've got a couple minutes for questions. So the question was, is there a time limit on the amount of time that a rental car could keep the data? No. It's, it's going to be in there until it's overwritten. Long time. Yeah, there's a company called Privacy for Cars. Their, their whole business is wiping, deleting the information off rental cars. Um, but no, and that's why search warrants are needed, right? Because retention periods, scope, those things that are important with search warrants, they need to be implemented when we, when we talk about the infotainment systems. Yes, sir. So when you have your car serviced, is it possible that your serv that the, um, dealership is going to be downloading um, 
the data from your car every time you go in and have it serviced. No, I, I don't think so. They, they would have to have the IV forensic tool. Yes, um, they, they would have to have the, a forensic tool to allow them to do that. So everything that we've seen that is collected like this requires a forensic tool to do so, which is that Burla tool to do it. Yeah. You briefly mentioned privacy for cars. Cars Is that a service that's available across the nation? Yeah, and, I believe it is. And in addition to rental cars, can you take your car by every once in a while and have it done to your car? I think you can. I, and that's what I would recommend. That they, they call it reflashing the data. Um, but, you know, the, the problem is, and, you know, and I, we'll need to push for this, and maybe Tesla will come with a, with a model that you can enter a passcode, but you, we, we have no way of encrypting the data on our, on our cars. Um, I'm involved in a case where Uber information was just subpoenaed, and of course that also gives you a map of where your client went when they were on the Uber. Does Uber also get your uh, cell phone information when you're in the car, and they can just pass that on under a subpoena? I don't know what Uber retains on their side. Uh, the actual, the phone itself will record those Uber trips commonly though. So depending on the make and model of the cell phone that you have, the cell phone will record that Uber trip. Uh, so it can't exist on there. And then I believe Uber does record the, the trips. Spencer, does Spencer know the answer to that one? Yes. yes. The answer is yes. No. So what I've heard of is police officers giving a, a suspect or a client's cell phone to them to unlock, to call their mother or something like that. And then them being able to figure out the passcode based on that, based on just a camera on the station or through forensic tools like, like Grayshift. So I, in terms of advice to clients like biometrics, passcodes, alphanumeric, I'd also say don't, don't take the, the really pol nice offer of, of the constable to uh, call your mom from your cell phone from the interrogation room. If they can get the passcode, then they can get the data from the phone. They're not doing that in the vehicle, being transit or anything like that, though, because you have to still have to plug a cable in either to the car or to the, to the phone itself to get that data using forensic tools. Uh, so it's not like happening over the wire. If they're recording, as, as Jonathan said, like a video where they're, they're capturing your actual finger touching the digits so they can get to that phone later, uh, they either have to do that or they have to use a utility like we have to crack the passcode on the phones to get the data. Uh, you can go into your Amazon account and actually see everything you've asked your Alexa, uh, including a recording of your voice saying it. So that's all with Amazon. You can actually access it through your account. Yeah, I don't have any of that stuff. I don't have a smart thermometer or ring doorbell or Alexa or any of that. Because I, I just assume that they're always recording, just like, you know, I close my laptop when I'm not using it. Because I just assume that the government is using those things that are available to them to you know, and not necessarily actively, but later on that they can collect that information from third party companies. Yes, sir. So it's two, it's two different issues, but you yeah. want to take that one? So, yeah, so different issues. First of all, the connection via Bluetooth or USB, both will transmit data. We were just showing that you can, we can tell how you connect to the car. Uh, so we can see that particular data. Typically, if you're going to transmit large amounts of data, you have to plug in because Bluetooth is not a protocol designed to do that. Yes, sir. That, if, if that is a smart kiosk or something like that, and not say a dumb charger, then absolutely it can compromise a device. Uh, I would not do that. We actually give away these cool little mini write blockers you plug a phone into. Uh, so email me, I'll send you one that'll keep you from that ever happening. Thank you.